And welcome back to Eureka 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of videos of things that I learned at the University of Regina as part of a, a Bachelor of Computer Science. And today we're going to be talking about another logical fallacy. We've spoken a, a, about a lot of different logical fallacies in this series, and if you haven't seen any of the other videos, I encourage you to go check some of them out. We're going to talk about the ways that this particular fallacy is related to a lot of them, so it may help to be informed about what those other fallacies are. Uh, but getting into it, the Texas Sharpshooter fallacy uh, is kind of in analogy to a uh, hypothetical situation where you have somebody in Texas with a gun, because you know, lots of people in Texas have guns, right? Uh, and so this person shoots at like a barn door or something. And they find that they uh, kept their kind of groupings in a small uh, kind of space, their groupings are good, and they get a shot like this. But it's just in the middle of, you know, some door somewhere. Uh, they, they may have had automatic on, who knows. But the important part is that they just shot at this door, and then they come through this door with a paintbrush, and then they draw a target on it. And they point to it and say, look, I got a bullseye. I'm such a great shot, uh, this, you know, being a Texas sharpshooter. Of course, that is a ridiculous uh, stance to take because there was no skill at all in getting this particular uh, bullseye rather than any other particular bullseye which you could have hit uh, and then drawn a target on. Uh, of course, there is something inherently unfair about drawing the target after you've shot. Uh, it kind of takes the skill right out of it. And that's the, 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 the kind of driving force of this particular fallacy. Um, or, or, and you can interpret it as a kind of, depending on the context, either to be cherry picking uh, or possibly even uh, the I don't know how to do statistics logical fallacy because all of the ways that you can do this are basically ways of failing at basic statistics. Now this video is not a, an entire course on statistics. If you want to learn every single way that you can mislead or, or mislead yourself or, or, or go wrong with statistics, you could literally take an entire degree just of that. And so this video will not go into depth uh, to that level for sure. Uh, but just as an example of ways that this could come up in practice. So picture, if you will, if you have some data set that uh, the data is kind of all over the place, And so we have this, this kind of very messy data set. You've gone into the field, you've collected some data on some topic, you get a result like this. And then you take a look at it and you go, well, there's this little clump right here. And so I'm going to take a look at this and kind of highlight those particular data points. And then say, is there a relationship that describes these? And of course, you could easily draw a line of best fit through those particular data points. And it would look something like that. And then you would conclude, well, this line describes this whole data set. And in order to prove that, I'm going to take some data points from this area here and then see if they're kind of fit well by this line. It turns out they are. You can get an R squared over for those particular points. And then you're done, right? No, of course not. That, if you, if you merely stop there, you have created some kind of a fiction that is intended to represent this whole data set but in fact only represents the subset that you use to paint your target, uh, to, to build your model. You're confirming your model with the same data that you built your model with. There's an inherent uh, step missing here, which is that it should represent the entire data set, not just the one you know, little target that you painted. And there are many, many ways of making the same mistake in many different areas of statistics. And again, if you want to learn all of them, go check out something like Khan Academy, which is an increasingly full uh, supply of videos about the different topics in statistics and their prerequisites. And so you can get a pre-informed opinion on most of these by going through and carefully learning everything and committing it to a uh, part of your memory that you'll actually use. So now that we kind of understand the, the basic idea here, how is this related to our other videos. How, how is this related to the other fallacies that we've talked about and the other ways that you can go wrong? So 
so starting kind of at the top, uh, if you go back to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 video, uh, you'll find that this is closely related because what you're doing here, here is you're basically overfitting your, your data uh, or, or you're creating a, 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 a way of viewing your data that doesn't really take everything into account and, and does so in a way that you're misleading yourself. And so th this is actually kind of a big issue. And although it's beyond the scope of this particular video, uh, we should actually think about how well the hypotheses that we make, how well the, the, the interpretations of the data that we have actually fit reality and actually fit the data sets as a whole that, that they are part of. And so how can we best create meaningful systems that actually represent the, the, the data in a way that doesn't fall into this particular trap. Think about it. Uh, and, you know, go, go again, if you're interested in it, go pick up a statistics te textbook because there are ways of dealing with data that are not uh, flawed as, at least at this particular level, and you can learn them. Uh, it's also generally that if you acquire your data and pick your data, uh, from different directions and from using different approaches, going back to the different approaches video, that you may not fall into this trap as often because your perspective isn't just a single area within the data set. You're going to see different areas of the data set. You'll have to actually have your, your output function or your output uh, line or, or, or whatever it is you're producing from it have to account for these, these different interpretations. And so that may be a way to protect against this particular fallacy happening. Uh, it's related to Occam's razor, of course, because you, your, your definition of simple, whatever it is, whatever the context you are in, cannot merely be just that it's a linear relationship. If there's a messy data set like this, if that is what you interpret to be simple, you are committing this fallacy. And so whenever you get into situations where you're having to account for complicated things, don't use Occam's razor as an excuse to make this mistake. Uh, be careful about what you consider to be simple and make sure that it does encompass the entire data set to the extent that's possible. The uh, 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 converse fallacy video, uh, th this is really just an example where the group that's exceptional that you're picking out uh, is just a, a subset of the data set, right? And so you're, you're making the mistake that you're, you're treating the whole as though it were part of this data set. So again, it's very related to this particular fallacy. The ecological fallacy, uh, going back to that video, uh, you can always select, uh, and we're going to get into this a little bit more as we go here, uh, a group that makes your particular conclusion true. Again, you can always paint a target, or you, you can usually paint a target around uh, your data set. And so the, the idea of you know, making someone have or appear to have some qualities because they're part of a group is kind of doubly dangerous if you can define what group they're in to make them look bad. So that, that fallacy at, at least is related in that way. Uh, going back to the did you use all the data video? Uh, did you cherry pick the data? Did you select the data purely to prove your point? Or did you actually go through and try to fit all of the data points into your kind of answer? Uh, if you have used all the data, you're obviously not going to be guilty of this. And so it's worth going back and kind of looking at that particular video uh, and seeing if you can fit these other pieces into your puzzle. Uh, the Addicto Simpliciter video, uh, going back to that, that you can, th this is really what it is, it's a general rule. And it's a very poorly constructed general rule, and it's one that doesn't describe all these kind of other instances. And so you can make it seem like this is true uh, and then fall into the trap that this is true for the entire domain that you're dealing with, even though it's not actually very representative. Uh, it's related to the circular cause and consequence video, because really what you're doing is you're confusing cause and effect and you're producing something of a circular argument. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's worth going back and to see why that isn't such a good idea as well. It's related from the argument from incredulity video. Uh, and if you go back, I encourage you to uh, go back and watch that as well. Uh, because what's being ignored here is the possibility that the effect itself would happen anyway due to chance. And that this clumping here, this linear relationship, uh, things like it are going to come out in random data. And you can measure the chance of that particular thing happening in random data and then weigh it against 
the strength of your conclusion. And so you're, if, if all you're picking up is noise, you should at least be aware that chances are that you could pick up that particular signal as, or noise as signal. Um, and so it's, it's worth considering and learning about what kinds of things can happen with random data. What kinds of clumps can come out when you have spatial data given in a random order? Uh, what are your odds when faced with random data? We're thinking about, we're, we're going through doing the math on it. Even if you've never taken a statistics class, try to think about it. Try to, to, try to model it yourself. See if you can derive some of the laws of statistics on your own. Uh, it's not as hard as it may seem. It's related to the package deal fallacy. Uh, one of the videos I saw doing research for the, this video is a, uh, another gentleman doing a series on logical fallacies. And he had uh, a kind of a, a really good example on this one where uh, he went to a couple of uh, white power rallies. And how the white power rallies would work is they would give kind of like a two minutes of hate or 20 minutes of hate uh, where they would show someone, usually black, uh, committing some violent or vile act, and then they would go to the next person, who is usually black, and then they do the same thing, and so on and so forth, and basically package up this small subset of the population that they hated uh, without giving you kind of the full context of those particular actions and any potential confounding variables. And so you wind up with a situation where you're, you're basically training people, training your, your white power flock, uh, to only live and only experience and only interpret data as if it were all in this kind of region. So again, it's, it's very related to that as well. Emotion and the appeal to emotion, going back to that video, may cause us to be ready to accept that a pattern exists where there are not. Uh, it will prime us to be willing to see something, uh, to, to ready ourselves for something to be experienced, even if it's, again, just noise and just something that would have come up by chance anyway in the data. The politician syllogism is also related uh, to this, and, and it's a particular dangerous one because uh, it can be used to retroactively justify the politician's syllogism. And so you can get into a point where the argument will go, you know, we must do something, uh, this is something, therefore we must do this, and then retroactively look and then say, okay, well, that something must have worked because we have this you know, clear effect showing our desired result. Uh, of course, you can probably uh, use this to retroactively justify practically anything, but in that particular context, uh, it's, it's very hard to kind of see out of once you're in it. It's related to the uh, fallacy of composition and division, and again, the forest and trees video. Go back and watch those three. Uh, it, it may be that the parts and the whole, the scale that the parts and the whole operate on are uh, different between different areas of this particular data set. And so if you're purely looking at this subset of possible uh, situations where the parts of the whole are interacting, you're again missing the bigger picture. It's similar to the moving the goalpost video, uh, and it, going back to that one, and the begging the question one as well, where basically you're defining success such that it's your success rather than any kind of truth, uh, rather than actually convincing the other person in a way that passes information from you to them, you're merely making it so that you're right regardless of the facts. That is, of course, not an honest way to discuss, not an honest way to argue. So one of the ways that you can get into this situation is to accept data points until your conclusion is, is proved, or until you're, you're confident of your conclusion. Uh, without considering the possibility that if you accepted further data points that your conclusion would not be as supported by the data. So if, if for example, if we start with some data like this, and you notice that the last ones were all kind of in this line again, and so that again confirms this kind of linear relationship, and then if you stop there, you miss all the other data, which is fully spread throughout the graph. I'm not going to show the math that suggests the possibility of this happening, but it's worth going through and actually trying to figure out what are the odds of this particular path of data uh, to actually happen in a random data set. If you don't take that particular approach, you can subject yourself to the experiments that the results look like they're valid and they look good and you publish them and the, the math kind of checks out 
until you try to replicate them and then you get the rest of the data and then you find out that you were wrong all along. This uh, does happen in science. There is a significant number of studies in psychology and other fields uh, that when they try to replicate them, they find that they cannot because of this exact issue. Uh, there's one specific one that I found while researching this particular video uh, that was mentioned by Rational Wiki, uh, which was, quote, feeling the future experimental evidence for anomalous uh, retroactive influences on cognition and effect by one Daryl Bem. I read that paper. I remember that this is you know, something that they could have easily been guilty of, but their data was so good that the, the amount of, of kind of probability against odds was so good that it, it's, it just shows how powerful this effect could be. Um, and I encourage you to go read that paper uh, and to see if you can spot where they made this mistake. Uh, so uh, as kind of mentioned, uh, this is confirming and making the, the, the model or the argument with the same information. And, and so all you're really doing is you're proving that your own uh, kind of shot is correct, or is consistent. You're, you're not necessarily shooting at the target, and you're not necessarily uh, being correct in what you're saying. All you're doing is you're, you're trying to make a claim that there is a, a relationship in the subset of the data. And in, in general, this, this fallacy will be used when you want to ignore differences of the data, or between the data, uh, but stress similarities between parts of, or, or examples of the data. And so you're throwing away information on both of those sides as you do that. You'll also run into this situation a lot when you have a lot of data. When you have, say, big data, uh, is, is kind of a in vogue today uh, to refer to this amount of data, where you have just more information that you could go through by hand and kind of read yourself, where you have you know, computers collecting enormous amounts of data, and then you have to go through with it somehow, uh, it's easy to make this mistake. Uh, because all you're really able to do is focus on some small subset. If you don't choose your subset well, uh, and if you don't tie your conclusion to how well you can prove you chose your subset, you're going to be guilty of this. What are some more examples of this? Uh, Nostradamus uh, is a person who wrote a whole bunch of books about uh, various things that could potentially happen in the future. Uh, they're filled with you know, stanzas of things that uh, you can kind of interpret as hypotheses. Uh, and then as time goes on, we've got more and more and more and more time of now billions of human beings living and you know, in being involved with political intrigue. Uh, and as time goes by, it's possible to see that some of the things that he described describes rather well the things that actually happened. Does this mean that he predicted them? Well, in a sense he did, because he wrote it down. But in the important sense, he really didn't, because all he did uh, is he drew kind of random lines. And, and then it turns out that some of those random lines end up matching the data. Does this mean that he had any kind of credible reason for believing any of them? No, because there's a possibility that the things that he said would happen regardless of the whether he said them or not, and regardless of whether or not uh, what el whatever else was happening in the world, uh, just by pure chance. And again, you can go through and you can figure out what the odds of that chance actually is, and then, again, try, try to figure out whether it should be believed that he had anything to do with it or not. And so it's if you make enough predictions, you're going to hit once in a while. Uh, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day if it's an analog clock. Uh, there's, there's the, the, it's going to force us to consider what is an acceptable way of testing a hypothesis that we have, what level of certainty can we actually hold these particular hypotheses of, given what we know about the data. Again, it's this video is already getting too long to get into how to do these things, but it's important to actually try. It's important to look up and to see how people are actually approaching this problem because it's a problem that has you know, a very big impact if you're uh, you know, worried about the end of the world, say, as predicted by Nostradamus. Uh, another thing worth pointing out uh, is that human beings are a terrible source of randomness. Uh, you can do so, so much better than picking random numbers or random information off of your the top of your head. 
uh, a computer, if you have the right uh, hardware set up and you've set, you know, calibrated it correctly, can give you random information. You can get random in information off of some physical processes. Human beings don't get that kind of information out of them. When you think you're giving out random information, and if you think without actually doing the calculation that what you're seeing is possibly random, you're probably wrong. And you should go and double, you know, talk to someone who knows how to do this, and you know, or, or look up the statistics and actually learn how to do it yourself. But just don't trust your intuition on what is and is not random, because you will mislead yourself. And if you try to do that with other people involved, you will mislead other people. One of the, the, the best examples of this is the MMR versus autism scandal, uh, where the original study, if you go back and look at what caused people to start to freak out, uh, was one study with 12 children, all 12 of which were uh, there or involved because of some conflicts of interest. But even if you ignore the, the vast conflicts of interest and the, the kind of illegal activity that was going on as that, that study was taking place, it's only 12 children, and the amount of conclusions that they were able to draw from that were not justified by the amount of data that they had. And even the, of the 12 children that they had, four of them didn't even go and get checked out for autism, which is, you know, you're, you're cutting your data size down to eight and, and even less than eight in, in some cases. So uh, it's just obscene how bad the, the, the cherry picking and the uh, sharpshooting it was in that particular case, uh, because you, they were they were try basically proving what they wanted to believe based on an extremely small subset of the data. That once you look at the bigger picture and look at the thousands of children who are affected, the the effect goes completely away, and that's kind of worth knowing about. Uh, it's also worth considering what happens when you put power into this picture. And so, for example, in a workplace where you have a, dif a distribution of tasks uh, based on the, the amount of social status uh, within the company that each individual has. Uh, so you can get into situations where the there are people with high status within the company that have uh, are able to select tasks that they are willing to do that gives them a high bang for the buck in terms of social status. Uh, this will allow them to uh, look like they're very accomplished even if their skill level and the amount of, of, of actual ability to solve those tasks and problems is not all that much better than average, if it's even better than average. But because they're able to show that this is the, the set of things that they're, they have done, again, other people will not be as critical and will not realize that you know, they, they could have given that task to someone else and that someone else could probably have done that same task, and so that they're not necessarily anything special. It, it, it's also worth pointing out that this problem of kind of confirming your knowledge with the data that you learn from uh, is not necessarily just something that we fit as human beings fail at. Uh, if you're training uh, neural networks and other AI systems, uh, you want to keep some of your data set uh, separate from what you originally trained your data on so that there isn't this problem, so that you don't end up kind of confusing uh, the amount of or the, the things that you're learning uh, with I guess its own justification. What are some other examples of this? If you go and look at Google, uh, the way most of us use Google is almost inherently related to this. You know, you, you, if you get into an argument with someone, you go and you start looking down the list of, of results that it gives you until you find one that confirms your belief. And then you get, you know, copy that out, and at best you'll click on two of the links that confirm your belief and you won't go down the list to see other data that may not confirm your belief and may in fact confirm the opposite of your belief. This, if you do this, uh, you're, you're running the risk of commi committing this particular fallacy. Same thing if you look for a, through a politician's record for the most you know, notch or nauseous or uh, terrible quote that they, they had. Uh, and so if you, s you know, George Bush was a good example on this one. He would occasionally say these just ridiculous, stupid things and get caught on camera or on microphone saying them uh, in a way that wasn't really true with former uh, presidents of the United States, uh, thanks to the widespread uh, ability of the internet to capture it. Um, but if, if you purely judge George Bush on those you know, missteps alone, uh, you wouldn't get the same informed view of him as 
if you had taken a larger view and looked at everything that he said, or everything, every impact of his policies, or every you know impact altogether, you know, yeah, that may actually still be you know something that confirms your your view of him. In many cases, it probably is. But again, it's 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 a difference between the extreme uh, examples and the general larger uh, data set in terms of what can be justified and what you would be justified in saying that you know. This is especially relevant for things that are not everyday occurrences. If, if you turn on the TV, for example, and you see uh, ways that the TV can convince you of things uh, or, or things that the TV or the, the TV channels would like you to be afraid of, uh, you would see, for example, stuff like terrorism, war, maybe Democrats, uh, etc. In, in, ter in terms of what their big worries are, uh, instead of the things that may actually hurt you, like for example, cancer, a stroke, or a heart attack, um, these are the things that you probably should be putting more of your life into worrying about. Yet, they're not necessarily the things that are talked about. And so, the, the problem is, is, is just like the white power rally I mentioned earlier, you're, you're kind of fed these examples uh, that are not likely, uh, that you're not necessarily going to be able to uh, experience firsthand all the time in, in order to get a more balanced opinion about, uh, so that when you get into this broader data set, you're not prepared for it. There's kind of a spectrum in this particular fallacy, uh, from lie by omission, where you're merely being dishonest about one thing, to cherry picking, where you're kind of being dishonest about many pieces of data, all the way to the actual Texas sharpshooter fallacy itself, where you're kind of drawing the lines of success uh, preemptively to make yourself win, all the way to moving goalposts, where you're continually moving the, the, the success criterion after uh, and while you're in discussion. It's also worth considering, what is the difference between anecdotes and evidence? Uh, this whole thing is possible because of anecdotal evidence. And the pl uh, the, as the saying goes, the plural of anecdote is not data. There has to be a, a connection between, the, or, or, or an absence of a connection between your anecdotes in order to find or make a conclusion based on the data of the set of your anecdotes. And if you don't know how to do this, uh, be very careful when drawing conclusions based on this kind of reasoning. And, ag and again, there's there's an entire field of statistics waiting for you to learn of all the different mistakes that you can make. And it is very, very treacherous to, to go out into random data and to make conclusions based on it without being informed by the statistics involved. Uh, another thing kind of related here is the idea of correlation and causation, uh, where you, you can find, again, lines in the data that basically show a relationship, uh, although it may be temporary or caused by chance. And the more data you have, the more of these lines that you're going to be able to draw. If you go check out Google Correlate, Google Correlate's a really neat tool, it's fun to play with, where you can get these spurious correlations, uh, and most of them are spur spurious. They're, most of them don't actually say anything about the world other than something happened by chance. Uh, and you can find all sorts of ways that different things that have nothing to do with each other correlate very highly together. That alone should cause you to be skeptical when anyone makes a statement backed by data without the level of uh, certainty that at least Google Correlate can offer. Uh, another example from a episode of uh, Radio Lab, which is, uh, again, another thing definitely worth listening to if you haven't, uh, which is uh, the story of the Laura Buxton. Uh, where basically a little girl uh, wrote her name, you know, please deliver to Laura Buxton on a balloon, let it go, flew up into the air, went hundreds of kilometers away, dropped down on another little girl uh, whose name was also Laura Buxton, uh, and the two of them had all these things in common. They you know, both came with the same pet, the, the same kind of pet, they wore the same kind of clothing, they had you know, just all these different similarities that made it unreal how close they were until you realize that the target had been drawn around them and that the reason that they were being talked about at all is because they were kind of selected and that the things that made them common were discussed and the things that 
were not common between them were not discussed. And so you start listening to the list of things that are common, you think this is just this amazing thing until you see how very different they are in practice from each other. A final note here is that if you're faked out by coincidences and correlations that would come up by chance anyway, you will fail to appreciate that which is truly meaningful in your life and that is unique to your specific situation and that is not merely just a, a whim of nature uh, presenting itself to you. So I encourage you to go find out what is actually valuable. Think about what is not necessary uh, or, or at least what it, what is not necessarily worth uh, crying home about, and then kind of enjoy your life from there. So, uh, as usual, if there's any questions, or if you'd like me to draw more of these pictures with lots of dots, uh, or if you'd like to make uh, conclusions based on no or your own cherry pick data, feel free to uh, leave any comments you'd like in any thread where this video is posted. Um, as usual, there should be a little Bitcoin donation address so you can help fund or uh, uh, whiteboard marker uh, fund for this particular video series uh, and hopefully uh, you enjoy. Uh, see you next video.